If you decide to recreate anything, it is at your own risk, and I do not accept the responsibility. Make sure you press the follow button on my Instagram, as if you were my ex pushing my buttons. So, I was in the IHOP last night trying to riz up some MILFs, and I thought of a good idea. My next video idea will be from the DEA's List 1 chemical list. I feel like every home chemist at least makes one of these. I saw something called nitroethane, but I really wanted to make something called nitromethane. One, it burns with a brilliant white flame, and it's pretty useful in a lot of reactions. <laughs> to start, we're gonna add 125 grams of chloral acetic acid. Mine did smoke a little, just because I had a little bit of water from cleaning it earlier. I used a tunic 1 liter flask, and I had a thermometer adapter on one of the sides to monitor the temperature. We're then going to put in some crushed ice, however I got these really cool molds and they kind of resemble an atom to me. And they also kind of look like basketballs and I could dunk them in the top. The reason we add the ice is to prevent the formation of sodium glycolate. This should help keep everything below 20 degrees celsius. It was quite annoying to add all this in and I had to put them in essentially one by one. Some of them stuck together, which was really annoying. Toby! Once all the ice has been added, you can see that the temperature is below 0 degrees Celsius, and we can actually go on to our next step. The next step of the process is to actually make this slightly alkaline. We need to make sodium chloral acetate, as this will be our next reactant in the next reaction. After I made the solution of sodium hydroxide, I actually cooled it in an ice bath before I put it in. I had to add it in slowly and in small amounts just so the temperature didn't go above 20 degrees celsius. The only issue was the ice melted pretty fast and it was pretty annoying to keep it under 20 degrees celsius. Here you can see the temperature shoot up when I added it in. The procedure said it should take about 90 ml of a 40% sodium hydroxide solution to make this slightly alkaline, however this really wasn't my case. I also had to check the pH every so often. You can also see a precipitate that comes out of solution when I pour the sodium hydroxide in. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but it does dissolve eventually. Eventually all of the ice melted and I had to get an exterior ice bath to cool things off. Though it really didn't help all too much. Eventually when I hit 90 mils, it was still pretty acidic and I had to add even more. Once it was alkaline, we had a color change to a slight yellow. Now, I did go past the faintly alkaline point and I got it pretty alkaline. Though, I read if you use sodium hydroxide, it wasn't that big of a deal. We're now going to add in a solution of 73 grams of sodium nitrite and 100 milliliters of water. This is where the nitrite ion will do a SN2 reaction and kick out chlorine as a leaving group. There was no reason for me to add this in slowly and I just dumped everything in. I made sure that the stirring was going, and I let it mix around for quite some time. Now let's actually get into how this makes nitromethane. The first two steps were quite easy, however the last part was the one that kind of confused me. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? I prayed to the chemistry gods for some help, and they ended up answering. Joey from That Chemist came to help me. He showed me how the mechanism works and I think we all owe it to him to go subscribe. With that being said, let's get into it. The reaction first starts by making the solution basic so nitrous acid isn't produced which would happen if the carboxylic acid wasn't neutralized. Then a SN2 reaction between the nitrite anion and chlorine as a leaving group. This produces sodium nitroacetate. Then we have a decomposition of sodium nitroacetate which liberates CO2 and nitromethane. A major byproduct is sodium bicarbonate, which hydroxide and carbon dioxide react to form it. We're now going to set up for a distillation with the thermometer in the reaction mixture. This is because we need to stop heating it once it reaches 80 to 85 degrees celsius. This will reduce frothing and a loss of nitromethane. I used a lab jack to lower the heating mantle as the easiest way to take away heating. The decomposition of sodium nitroacetate is pretty self-sufficient. It essentially heats itself for a little bit. 
As the reaction mixture is heated slowly, you can see it slowly turn into a more orange color. Yet another time, I'm cursed with orange chemistry. Well, at least it's not yellow chemistry. Sorry, Tom. Eventually, though, it actually turned quite red. When it did turn red, I could slowly see these bubbles start making its way towards the surface. This was a good sign, as a lot of CO2 was being ejected out. When I first saw this, I was very happy, as I didn't know if the reaction was going to work or not. To me, it reminds me when I open up a soda bottle and all the carbonation comes out. Though, once I started seeing this happen, I had to act quick and I had to shut off the heating. The thermometer also read 85 degrees Celsius, and I slowly started to lower the lab jack. As I lowered the lab jack, you can see the beautiful evolution of CO2 gas coming out of the solution. It reminded me of Fanta soda, and I was really tempted to take a drink. Though, we would lose yield on the nitromethane, and I'm not about to do that. It looks like the reaction mixture is boiling, but that's really just all of the CO2 coming out. Here, you can see two separate layers, one being cloudy and one being clear. The cloudy layer is our nitromethane. The decomposition of sodium nitroacetate brought the temperature to around 95 to 100 degrees Celsius. According to the procedure, around 30 milliliters of nitromethane should come over and about 40 milliliters of water. I also decided to wrap the entire apparatus in some aluminum foil. Once the temperature has dropped below 95 degrees Celsius, we now need to apply some external heat. I put the heating mantle back on, and I'm going to heat until this reaches 110 degrees Celsius. This should help us bring a little bit more nitromethane into our receiving flask. As the temperature got closer and closer to 110 degrees Celsius, the rate at which it dropped really reduced. We can also tell when the reaction is over, when no more CO2 is being liberated out of the solution. Though most of the CO2 production should be done by now, and by the time you reach 110 degrees Celsius, it should be over. Here, you can see our distinctive two layers, with our nitromethane being on the bottom. We're now going to pour everything into a separatory funnel, as we need to separate the nitromethane. You'll notice that the nitromethane goes to the bottom, and you'll also notice that the water layer has a slight tint of yellow to it. This is because nitromethane is very slightly soluble in water, and it's really important that we save the water layer to extract more nitromethane out of it. I first separated the nitromethane layer, and then I separated the water layer. When I was separating the nitromethane layer, I got a very nice fruity smell. The smell reminded me kind of like a genetically modified pear apple fusion. And here you can see our cloudy nitromethane. This is because it has a little bit of water in it. We're now going to collect our water layer, and we're going to make sure that we save this because we're going to redistill it. We should be able to cover a little bit more nitromethane when we do this. I really don't want a 5% yield. Here, you can see in our water layer that we actually have some nitromethane not dissolved and a little bit dissolved. To effectively distill out the nitromethane, we're actually going to need to salt the water. I kept adding salt into the solution until no more dissolved. I assume the procedure is doing this because it's doing something called salt effect distillation. This essentially raises the volatility and breaks any azeotropes. I set it for a simple distillation and I really just cranked the heat up and waited for something to happen. Once it was boiling, we had our nitromethane and a little bit of water coming over. I didn't expect to get a huge amount, but this is a lot at the scale that we're doing. Nitromethane is definitely a lot harder to get for home chemists, so everything counts. I stopped the heating when only water was coming over and we're left with this orangish solution. And you can see that we actually got a couple milliliters of nitromethane recovered. I would say that's a pretty good success. Again, we're going to put this into a separation funnel and we're going to separate out the nitromethane. I read through one of the papers and they said you don't need to do another distillation of the water layer. They essentially said it was a waste of time and to not really do it. I separated the nitromethane into our other stock of nitromethane. Take a drink every time I say nitromethane and you'll be pretty drunk by the end of this. Of course being at your legal drinking age. Once we had all of our nitromethane separated, we're actually going to put it back into the separatory funnel and we're going to wash it with some sodium chloride. A solution of sodium chloride to be clear. The sodium chloride solution will help pull any water into that layer. I washed two times and I didn't go for a third as I felt like I didn't need it. 
What I had to be careful of now is the sodium chloride solution is now the lower layer. This is because saturated sodium chloride is a lot denser than nitromethane, so we're going to take the bottom layer and that's going to be our discard. After doing our sodium chloride solution washes, you can see that our nitromethane layer is pretty clear now. We still need to dry this a little bit more, so we're going to put some 3A molecular sieves. This will hunt down any leftover water and it will trap it inside of it. You can think of the sieves as Doug the Bounty Hunter and it's going after some water. I decided to let the sieve sit in there for about 20 to 30 minutes before we go on to our next part. The last part is just to do a simple distillation so we can get some pretty pure nitromethane. I actually use the molecular sieves as boiling chips. I've read that they're still effective at at least 120 degrees celsius so I just decided to use them. Once everything started boiling, we actually started to collect our nitromethane. Nitromethane's boiling point is about 101.2 degrees celsius and I started to collect at that temperature. The nitromethane coming over was very clear and I was really happy to see it. My thermometer read 103 degrees celsius but this is a really cheap one and I don't really trust it. Or it was really spot on. Anyway, here's the last few drops of the nitromethane coming over and we got a pretty fair amount. Nitromethane is actually quite oily and it has a very unique refractive index. And by unique, I just mean it makes some cool rainbows. Measuring out our total yield, we actually got about 26 milliliters of nitromethane. Purifying the nitromethane did result in a little bit of loss, but that's okay. Our percent yield came out to about 36.71% and that's pretty close to what the procedure got. It was also suggested that improving yields is pretty obtainable by adding boric acid when you add the sodium nitride in. This is because sodium bicarbonate is destroyed by the boric acid which prevents the alkaline hydrolysis of the sodium chloral acetate. One of the unique things that nitromethane does is it burns with a brilliant white flame. I don't want to talk over the demonstration, so here it is. And that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching and huge thank you to all my Patreons. I cannot thank you enough for all of your support.